Okay, so we have sort of one last thing to finish up that really belongs in last class's material, and then we're going to move on to kinetic molecular theory of gases. So before we can actually move on to this, I want to do the one last example, this one. So we're going to start there. Okay. So you may notice the, the format of this one looks familiar to you as well, huh? All right, so we have hydrazine, and of course that's something I wouldn't expect you to name like that. Um, you could just name it dinitrogen tetrahydride. And they give you this reaction, and they tell you how much of the hydrazine reacts to produce how much of the nitrogen. And they want to know what's the percent yield. So first of all, what is percent yield? What's the like formula for that? No one remembers? Close. There's an actual and there's a theoretical. Is it minus? It's over. Good. Um, I think what, so good actual point that got brought up though, the minus, the actual minus theoretical over theoretical, what is that? That is something. It's percent error, right? So we don't tend to do a lot of that in this class just because, you know, we give you problems and so there's not really a percent error, but it's a good thing to remember for lab. Okay, so continuing on with this. So what do we have to figure out? We have to figure out each one of these, right? We have to figure out the actual yield, which is how much we made. And then we have to figure out the theoretical yield, which is how much we could have made if every little bit of it reacted and there was no loss, there was no side reactions, no anything. So we have two different things we have to do. All right. So for theoretical, at a nice little angle there for you. How do we do that? Where do we start? Do we start from the reactant to get theoretical or would we start from the products? Reactants, right? We want to know what's going to happen if every little bit of those reactants react. So that's where we're starting. So we're starting with the 2.45 grams of hydrazine. And we want to know the percent yield. So we know how much nitrogen we have So at the end. So we're going to go to try to go to nitrogen. Can we just go from grams to grams? And not easily. You, is, is, there's ways to do it, but not easily. So what do we need to go through? Moles. So we need to do that conversion factor. And we're going to need to do another conversion factor to go from moles to moles, right? And then do we need to convert to grams of nitrogen or should we leave it in moles or does it matter? Can you do either? So it doesn't actually matter because what's going to happen is, is that if you converted it to grams, it would just end up being both the top and bottom multiplied by the same number. So it doesn't actually matter. So let's leave it in moles because it's a little bit easier. It's one less conversion factor to do. And if we look at this, when we say what's this going to come out with, we have a volume and a temperature and a pressure. So what are we probably going to be solving for there? Moles. So why convert to grams? It's an extra step that you don't need to do. So where do we get this number from? And where do we get this number from? Now, is it balanced? Take a quick look. Oh, you can't see. There you go. Yeah, it's balanced. So we're okay there. So what are our two numbers that go here and here? One and one. Good. So we get that. Okay. So now we've got the one part done. Now we have to go through and do actual. So for this part we did stoichiometry because we were saying, well, let's say we, have, we use all of this up and there's nothing that goes wrong with the reaction and we get 100% yield. So we have that. Now we get to find out how much we actually made. So what are we going to do to figure that out? What equation are we going to use? Ideal gas law. And what are we going to solve for? Well, what do we have? We have volume, we have temperature, and we have pressure and we want moles. So we're solving for N. Okay, so we have this. So now we fill everything in. Okay. 
What R are we going to use? Point, we have two choices. We have 8.31, and that one has a, a unit of joules in it. And we have 0 .08, 0 0.0821, and that one has liters, atmospheres, and moles in it. Which one do we want to use? And for temperatures, 295K, and we get our number. Okay, so now what do we do? We have 0 0.0310 moles of N2. So now we just go ahead and fill into here. Oh, and since it's a percent, I did forget one thing. What did I forget? Yeah. Times 100% just to turn it into a percent. We're going to have to lose some of the question here. That's okay. And we do this and we get 40.5%. So, I suppose not absolutely horrible. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you mean rather than just, just putting in moles of N? Yeah. Well, so normally you're solving for either, you're, you're solving for one of the actual reactants. Um, it wouldn't actually matter in this case if you used N because both of them would just be doubled. Right, you'd have to double this one and you would have to double this one. But really when you're talking about percent yield, you want percent of an actual compound, like an actual species that you have at the end that you can kind of isolate and use in some way. There's another, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, you guys have to calm the chatter down again. So which, how do we know which one's theoretical and which one's actual? And this is a question that comes up a lot and people mix up on exams a lot, actually. So you want to think about what you actually have as opposed to what you could possibly have. So the idea here is we start with actual being what we actually obtain at the very end. What if we were doing this problem, we could isolate and we could use. And so when we look at this, that's going to be this amount because it says it produces. So it actually makes that much. Where as opposed to the theoretical, that's what we figure out using stoichiometry. If we're given, a, it, it's kind of what you figure out when you're first learn, learning stoichiometry, right? We tell you, hey, here's a reaction. And we say, we give you a certain amount of these. <coughs> and we ask you to solve for it. And we say, okay, well, how much product can you make? We kind of lie a little bit when we ask you that because we're saying it's 100% yield if we give you that. So that's the theoretical amount. Anything else on this one? All right, so now we can move on to kinetic molecular theory. Okay, so we sort of started with the bulk properties when it came to gases. We said, hey, if we take a, huge, a, a good sized amount of this and we can measure its pressure and its volume and its liters and, and we can measure all of this, and we did some explaining just sort of kind of based on a little bit of what we already knew about what these properties were, right? So if we raise the temperature, for instance, what would happen to the volume? Raise the temperature. Think the air mattress tire examples. It gets bigger, right? And so that, you know, the reverse of that, if we cooled it down, it got smaller. Well, what if we had it in an actual, like, a container that couldn't move? What would happen to the pressure then? If we, if we raise the temperature, what would happen to the pressure? It increases, right? Because now it can't get bigger like the balloon did. Remember when we shrunk the balloon? It can't actually get bigger and smaller. It's a fixed size. So instead, the pressure is going to change. And the pressure would go up if we made it go faster, or if we made it get hotter. And it would go down if we made it get cooler. And we walked through all of those. But we never really gave you real reasonings for it. I kind of started explaining it a little bit in the sense when I told you about the, you know, what if we took all the, the chairs out of here and had you guys wander around. I was actually touching on kinetic molecular theory when we did that. Now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. 
So the, what we need to start with is remembering what kinetic energy actually is, right? So there's that brief little section in the fundamentals there about that. But this is going to kind of touch on that quite a bit. So with kinetic theory of gases, a lot of these, what we have to assume about the gases are the exact same as for the ideal gas law. Because the ideal gas law is sort of explaining the, the, the bulk properties where kinetic molecular theory goes a little more into what's actually going on with the molecules. So just like before, we're going to assume that the molecules are point masses. And what that means is that all of the mass is in this infinitesimally small amount of volume. There is no volume. The volume is zero, but there's still mass. You assume constant random motions, same as before, right? We didn't say the gas had any particular you know, director or anything like that. It was just moving around randomly. And that all collisions were elastic. Now, what did col elastic collision collisions mean? What happens to the energy in a collect in a Elastic collision. Yeah, you don't lose any, right? They might bounce off each other, and maybe one has a different energy than it used to, but the overall energy between those two are the same. So that's an elastic collision. So energy is transferred, but total energy remains the same. So once again, just like the ideal gas law, gas molecules are neither attracted nor repulsed. So that means there's no interaction, right? If you have two gas molecules and they come near each other, they're not going to attract each other, they're not going to repel each other. For, for this theory. Now, of course, is all of this true for real gases? No. So, of course, this, you know, there's going to be times this breaks down, and we'll talk about that at the end of this chapter. Average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. So that means as you increase the temperature, what happens to the kinetic energy? It increases. Now, notice I say average. Does that mean that every single particle increases when you increase the temperature? Yeah, most of them are going to in order to shift, but it doesn't mean that they all have one exact temperature. It means that there's a range of temperatures and we're just looking at the averages. So we'll go into all of these in more detail now. Okay, let's look at this average kinetic energy issue. So at two different temperatures, um, gas molecules are, could have the exact same energy. So what, what we want to look at here is with the masses. So we need to look at this equation one more time, and we need to look at this. So I say exact same kinetic energy. Now, if they have the same kinetic energy, but they have different masses, what else has to be different? Velocity. So we'll explain this to you in a second. What are you used to seeing right here? V. So let's just call it V for now. So one half mv squared, that's, that's the kinetic energy you're used to seeing, right? So if the kinetic energy of two gases at the exact same temperature, we take helium and we take nitrogen and we put them at the same temperature, I'm telling you their kinetic energy is going to be the same. Yet their masses aren't the same. So that means their speed has to be different, right? So they're going to be inversely related. So if what that means is, remember, helium and nitrogen, two things that have different masses, they're going to have the same kinetic energy if they're in the same temperature. So nitrogen's mass is bigger, so what does that mean about the velocity? It's going to have to be smaller, okay? So the higher the mass is, the smaller the velocity is going to be at some given temperature. So that's what I mean by inversely related. Now they're not directly inversely related because of that squared, right? So there's going to be some square roots in there when we actually start calculating these. Okay, so let's quickly go back to this simulation, to this website that I like so much. Let's empty this out a little bit. I was playing with it before class, so. Okay, so let's look at this. Before when we had done this, we had only looked at one sort of particle. I had just been showing you the blue ones, right? But this scenario, which probably if you went and played on it like I asked you to, you saw that you could also put a couple of different types of gases into it. So you could put a lighter species and you could put a heavier species. So I put a lot of room here. We're going to be doing a couple of different things with this today. So if I add in this, we have a really light species. It's shown by being smaller, which um, we have to assume they have no volume, but you can't see something that has no volume. So we have to do that. We can put a heavy species in too. And this does a good job of showing you that, hey, look, is there a speed difference here? Definitely, we can see that. So if that helps you remember, you, now that you have sort of a visual picture of it too. 
Now, if we cool it down, what do we think is going to happen to the average speed of both? It's going to slow down, right? Now, notice they slow down, but the blue one's still going to be slower than the red one. The big one's still going to be the smaller one, okay? And we'll come back and forth to this a few times today. Okay, so next thing then to talk about, pressure. So what we hadn't really discussed was what actually causes pressure. So if we want to think about this container and we want to say what's causing the pressure here, first of all, what's going to happen if I add heat? What's going to happen to the pressure? It's going to go up. And just for good measure, what's going to happen to the speed of the molecules? It's going to go up. Okay, what do we think causes pressure? If we want to think about like the balloon, for instance, because you can change the volume without changing the pressure, what makes the balloon expand? Let's think real simple terms. How do I make a balloon expand? How, think how a five-year-old would answer this question. You put air in it, right? Okay, so why would that make it expand? There's more particles, and those particles are going to be pushing against the rubber on the balloon, right? So all of my breath going into the balloon is pushing the balloon out. So the air molecules are pushing out on the balloon. So now let's put it in a rigid container, not a balloon, so that we can increase the pressure. So if I raise the temperature, these are going faster. They're hitting the sides of the wall faster, okay? If I add more molecules in, now they're hitting the walls at the same speed, but there's more of them hitting the walls. So both of those will raise the pressure. So that's what this slide basically says in words. So our pressure is created by the collisions on the container, okay? So it's the molecules hitting the edges of the container that's causing the pressure. The faster the molecules hit, the more pressure there's gonna be, right? It's gonna be hitting it with more force, and so there's gonna be more pressure. Now, by that same token, so this would be like um, raising the temperature. So this, this bullet point is what I did when I increased the temperature. Now, this bullet point is what I did when I said, how, how do you make them more frequent? Well, you put more molecules in there is one way. Also, just by raising the temperature, it increases the frequency, right? Because now they're going faster, and so they're hitting it more often. So now, let's think about how each of these relate to the ideal gas law. What do we know happens to the pressure as temperature goes up? It goes up too, right? And now we can see why. If temperature goes up, what happens to the speed? It increases. So does it hit the wall harder or softer? Harder. So temperature increases, or pressure increases as temperature increases because of that. Um, now the more frequent one, what law does that relate to? More molecules, right? And temperature, actually, to the speed. So this works, because, this works with the, the moles and the pressure. If you add more moles, what happens to the pressure? It increases. And that's because you're making the, the molecules hit the edge of the container more often. So these definitely right relate to the ideal gas law. It explains why the ideal gas law works. Um, in your book, it has a pretty intense derivation of it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that's, I, I just put that there for your reading. You, you skim through it, it's interesting, but don't memorize it. Now, let's look at this equation again. So I hand waved away the, the, U, the, the U mean squared, right? I, could, I sort of said, let's just call that V for now. Now let's go back and talk about that a minute. So what is this thing that I put in there instead of V? Well, that's the average molecular speed. So it's like a velocity, but now I'm saying it's the average velocity over all of the molecules. Because now we can't just pinpoint one molecule and say, okay, you have that speed, so that means everybody else around you has that speed. That's not how gases work. There's always gonna be a distribution to it. So this is the average molecular speed. So I'm gonna show you a graph of this in just a minute, but the, this is always what you're gonna use. You use it the same way as you use velocity. For the most part, you'd be given it. I would tell you the URMS, or I'd have you calculate it with a different equation that we're gonna learn here in a minute, one of the two. So you use it just like velocity, but you need to know a little bit more about it in the back of your head in case I ask you questions on it. Looks like people are still writing a little bit, so I'll give you a few more seconds. So we're gonna, this next slide that I'm gonna do is gonna be a graph of all of this. Okay, so here are two different graphs. Let's start with this one. So in this one, we're looking at nitrogen and just nitrogen. What's the difference between the three graphs? 
temperature, right? Okay, so we've seen graphs kind of like this before where we have something down here. Um, I think last time we saw it, it might have been wavelengths in number of photons over here. But now what we have is molecular speed. So this is the particular speed that any given molecule could have. And this is the number of molecules. So this is like a count. It's saying how many molecules have this speed? So think of this, this is kind of like your grade distributions, right? If you, if you look at a grade distribution online on Triple E and you see, okay, you, this many people have this, this many people have that, it's the same idea, only now it's a constant instead of a bar graph. So if I were to point here, you could say, well, this many molecules have this much speed. Now, do we, we don't really have to have a number here though, right? Because all of this is just in relation to each other. So just like in the distribution, you don't care how many people got, you know, 75%. You just care whether that was the average or not. Same thing here. We care about the approximate number here as opposed to here as opposed to here. It's a count. Okay, so now let's look at what's happening. As your temperature is increasing, what would you expect would happen to your speed? Increase too. Is that what's happening? So this is where the graph kind of gets people sometimes. Your peak is going down, right? But the peak going down is just because the distribution is being spread out. It's being stretched. So where is this average speed at? About 250. So if, you're, if you figure your average is somewhere around your peak, this isn't actually a Gaussian, so it's not right at the peak, but it's close. So if you figure your average is somewhere around here, it's about at 250. What's your average at the 300K? You know, just throw out a number. 400-ish, yeah, so that, did that get bigger? Did, is 400 bigger than 250? Yeah, so it definitely got bigger. Now what about this one? About where is that at, you know, approximately? Yeah, 750, something like that. So that got bigger. So your peak is getting smaller, but that's just because you're stretching the distribution out. You're making it wider. And so the number of molecules with any particular speed is gonna get smaller because you're giving them a wider distribution of speeds. Now it's not just that the molecules can be from zero to like 750 and then there's hardly any above it. For 300K, now it can be from zero all the way up to like, you know, about 1200 before it gets really, really small. 700K, you can go zero to like 1700 before it gets really small. So make sure you realize that, okay? As, this shows you that as your temperature increases, so does your speed. It's just that now you have a wider distribution of molecules, molecular speeds that you can have. Okay. So that takes care of kind of temperature and speed. Now let's look at over here. If you, th this one shows all at the same temperature, so they've set it at 300 Kelvin, but now what's the difference? The masses, right? The masses are different. So what have I already told you about masses? What happens as something gets bigger? It gets slower. As something gets smaller, it gets faster. So of chlorine, nitrogen, and helium, which one would you expect to be the fastest? Helium. And that's exactly what we see, right? Because what's the average speed here-ish? 300 maybe, 250, something like that. Average speed here, 500-ish. Average speed here, 11-ish, something like that. So we can see that that's how it's getting faster as we go along. This has a really small distribution. It's at a low temperature, or at a low speed. This gets a little bit faster and a little bit faster, okay? So these would be, I, would ex I, I could expect you to replicate this sort of graph. That's not beyond, you know, ability levels in, in for the final exam. I could also give you the graph and then ask you to label it. For instance, I could do this and leave off the 100, 300, 700 and ask you to put those on the graph for me. I could, you know, give you this and leave off these and ask you to put it on there for me. Those are all sorts of things I could do. Okay? All right. Actually, any questions about that? Just, you know, to make sure. No? Okay. Root mean square speed. So going, still kind of getting into that root mean squared issue. Okay. According to kinetic theory of gases, the total kinetic energy per mole is three halves RT. You don't necessarily have to realize why. If you are absolutely dying to know, um, come to my office hours and I'll walk you through the derivation in the book. Um, but for the exam, you don't need to know where it comes from. Just be able to use it. So if, one, if the kinetic energy of one atom is that, so if you're thinking this is kinetic energy of one atom, right? Now technically, I guess that should be a V if we're talking one atom. Now, if we wanna say 10 atoms, 
it's just going to be 10 times that, right? So this is where we're, we're getting into where this comes from. What's a mole? Well, that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, right? So if I know that the kinetic energy of one atom is equal to this, I know that the kinetic energy of 10 atoms is equal to 10 times that, and I know that the kinetic energy of one mole is equal to one mole times that. Um, and this is molar mass, is a fancy M. So this gets into another equation that we have. And this one I do want you to know how we arrived at this, how we were able to get this equation. So if I give you this result, th I say that this is the kinetic energy of a mole of atoms derived a different way. And I tell you that now we can derive the kinetic energy of a mole of electrons this way too. We can say, well, if we know the kinetic energy of one atom and we know that that's one half mv squared, we can just multiply that by Avogadro's number and we know the kinetic energy of a mole. So that's a mole times one half mv squared. Remember, you can think of this as v. What is it really? It's average speed, but we can think of it as v. So we've taken a mole and we've multiplied it by the kinetic energy equation that we've known since either high school, chem 1p, or fundamentals, depending on when you learned it. And we've set it equal to this other, other equation that I've now given you and told you about. Now let's rearrange it for the average speed. So we're going to just solve the equation. This is the algebra, right? We've taken this and we have divide everything across. So now we have 3 ha 3RT divided by M, which is your molar mass, square rooting it so that we can solve for this. Okay, one more time, let's walk through it. I told you this, I said this is true for a mole of atoms. It comes from kinetic molecular theory. We've now solved for kinetic molecular theory and said, okay, well let's set this result that we get from the kinetic molecular theory and set it equal to the kinetic energy that we know and love. That we know and love, right? You love it, yes. Okay. I heard groans and I didn't like that. Now we solve for the URMS. And now we have this equation for URMS, okay? So this is another equation that we have that we can use. So if we want to solve for the average speed, we can go ahead and we can fill into 3RT over M. Yeah? Uh, say that one more time. What does RMS stand for? I still didn't hear you. Oh, root mean squared. So she asked what RMS stands for. This that stands for root mean square. Good question. Okay. Now let's go ahead and use this. So first of all, actually, let, let's look at this one more time and make sure that it agrees with what we know. What do we know about the average speed of molecules as mass increases? As mass increases, what happens to the average speed? It, it does the op or, right? Mass increases, so speed decreases. Is that what's going to happen here? If mass increases, what's going to happen to speed? It's going to decrease. So good. It goes along with what we've already seen. Yeah? Oh, that's Avogadro's number. Yeah. So don't forget, NA is a lot of times used for Avogadro's number. It's sort of a shorthand notation. It's easier than writing out 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd all the time. Yeah? Uh, it's, um, just NA. Um, it's the, yeah, it's the molar mass. And you'll see it in your book, it'll be written like all fancy like. But, okay. And we just talked about that. So now you have it written down. Yep. Ooh, good question. What R do you think you use? So you have to kind of look at what you're dealing with here. What temperature do we have? Or we have Kelvin. And we have molar mass. Did the R that we had before have any molar or any mass unit in it? Had liters, atmosphere, Kelvin, and mole. No mass unit at all, right? What, what unit do we know does have mass hidden inside of it? Joules. So we're going to want to use the, the joules one here, the 8.31 one, one. Good question. Yeah? Um, so if you had double the amount of moles, you would have double the amount of kinetic energy, but not average speed because it would be divided by the number of moles, right? 
So if I double the point value on a test, does that change your average? Well, not really, because you would have double the number of points right. It's the same idea here. You don't change an average by doubling the number. You change the total, but you don't change the average. Anything else? Lots of good questions. OK. So let's do an example. OK. Again, with the transfer of the computer, spoiler alert, but that's OK. <laughs> Calculate the RMS of helium and nitrogen molecules. So this time, I just want you to calculate the root mean squared speed. So we have this equation now. We can use this equation now that we've derived it. And remember, I don't care if you know where the 3 halves RT comes from, but I would like you to be able to explain how we got this equation like we did on the last slide. OK, so let's do it for helium first. So we just basically fill in. If all I ask you is for the root mean squared, all you have to do is fill in your numbers. Now, I say all you have to do with a little bit of, of hesitation, though, because you do have to watch your units and watch all of that, right? You need to make sure that this is, that R is an 8.314, so the joules per Kelvin mole. And then there's one other thing you need to make sure you do that so many people forget. What do you think that is? This is in kilograms, right? So it's the molar mass, but it has to be in kilograms. And why does it have to be in kilograms? Because this is joules, and joules has kilograms in it. So don't forget that joule is the SI unit for energy, but it's one of those compound units where it's made up of different things. And so you have to go ahead and you have to take and realize that this has a kilograms in it, and this has to be converted into kilograms or else you're going to have problems. Okay. So if you make sure you do all that okay, then you can just go ahead and solve. So again, it's just filling into the equation, but making sure you use the right R and that you convert the molar mass down to kilograms per mole. And if you do all that and you watch all of your units careful enough, you'll see that you get meters per second, which is what you would want for a speed. Yeah? It's, it's the other constant for R. So I give you two values for R. I'll give you the, point, the 0 0.0821, which is the liters atmosphere Kelvin mole one. And then I'll give you this one, which is the joules per Kelvin mole one. So I'll, both of those will be given. You won't have to interconvert between them. OK, so nitrogen, same thing. Again, remembering you have to convert to kilograms, so kilograms per mole. So it is a little easier than some of your other ones. So since we are kind of near final exam review time, remember when we were in quantum, and we were in our quantum chapter, and we had to make sure we converted from, from the periodic table mass? And we were in converting into atoms, right? We were converting into kilograms per atom. This is easier than that because it's just kilogram per mole. So don't, when you start studying for quantum, don't forget about that. Don't forget that a lot of times in that case when you're solving for things like the de Broglie wavelength, you're in kilograms per atom. Don't do that here. This is kilograms per mole. So make sure you recognize the difference as you're in your cram sessions and everything is getting combined. They're different. This one's kilograms per mole. So you're converting to kilograms per mole. Say it with me. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, this is just one of those things that comes up on the exam a lot. And in quantum, most of the time when we were doing de Broglie wavelengths, we wanted kilograms per atom. OK. Units are important. <laughs> yes? Can you say that a lot louder? Yeah, that's the mass of N2 in kilograms per mole. So it's just the 28 grams per mole divided by 1,000. OK, and so we get that. Um, OK, next, so this kind of, this kind of comes, oh, yeah. Uh, would the temperature in Kelvin be given to you? <gasps> yes. Yeah, I didn't tell you. So I should have said, yeah, I should have said at room temperature. Yeah, I wouldn't make you guess the temperature. Anything else? OK, so next question then, so that kind of goes off this. So helium's faster, right? We can, we can look at this and we can see that. We can see that helium's a lot faster. And that's what we would expect, right, because it weighs less. So to escape gravity, a molecule must have a certain velocity. Which is more likely to escape Earth's gravity? The, the fast one or the slow one? Which one's more likely to have the velocity that's fast enough to escape Earth's gravity? Yeah. So what does that mean about the composition of our atmosphere? Is it more likely to be heavy in nitrogen or heavy in helium? Yeah. 
So, wait, actually say that one more time. Helium's gonna escape, so what's left? Nitrogen, there we go. <laughs> okay, so um, when the place where I got this um, question from had, had asked about how does this relate to the composition of our atmosphere, and I thought it was kind of interesting, right? You don't normally think about where our atmosphere comes from. It comes from a lot of different places. But the idea that helium would escape more often and we would lose a lot more of that to, you know, out and away from the atmosphere, from our gravity, than what we would nitrogen. Okay, switching gears a bit, still kinetic molecular theory but a different part of it. Diffusion and effusion. So diffusion tends to be what gets talked about most of the time because it's a little, it's not exactly normal in life to be letting something into an empty container, right? Normally what does that container have in it? Air of some sort, right? Just a random mixture of air. And so what that actually is though is it's actually diffusion. If I had a helium tank up here and I squirted helium out into the air, I would be letting the helium diffuse into the air. It would be mixing with the gas that's already around us. Now, there's something else called effusion, and effusion is a bit different. That's where instead of taking a gas and putting it into another gas, um, you're taking a gas and putting it into an empty container. And by empty, I mean there's no air in there either. It's a vacuum, okay? So, it would go through a small container. That's the other difference too. When you're talking about effusion, normally you have a very small area that the gas is allowed to flow from one to the other. And then you could let it you know, go back and forth or maybe you, you wanna keep it flowing for a different purpose. We're gonna talk about it in a second. So these are sort of two definitions for you. Diffusion, which you've probably already heard of, but now we've defined a little bit better, right? It's, it's mix, two, two gases mixing. And then effusion, which is going from a container into an empty container, a vacuum. Now, before we start talking about the math of diffusion, or effusion, excuse me, there's, there's some interesting applications of effusion that I thought it worth talking about. Oh, sorry, more pictures. Um, so that just you know, explains what I was talking about. And that's um, uranium enrichment. This is one of the ways that they do it. There's different ways that they do it. But um, so why would we care about enriched uranium? Why do we want enriched uranium? We need, so you'll hear about this in the news. They're, t they're talking about enrichment facilities, things like that. And they start worrying about when people make enrichment facilities because the idea is that you can't do anything with nuclear anything, whether that be weapons or power, with just uranium straight out of the ground. Uranium straight out of the ground is a mixture of, of two different, what are these called? Isotopes, good. Two different isotopes, remember what's different about isotopes? Number of neutrons, good. Um, two different, so two different isotopes. In order to actually do much with the nuclear things that we're used to talking about, you need to have it enriched to 235. It needs to be about 90% uranium-235. And so you have to be able to do this. Now, there's actually, there's lots of different times that we need particular isotopes enriched as well, but this is the one you hear about in the news the most, so this is the one I wanna talk about. So one of the ways that they do this is they take and they make UF6 out of it. So you, what would that be called? Uranium hexafluoride, good. And, and they put it under really high pressure and they put it through a container. And then they put a membrane here so a membrane that's permeable to UF6. But what do you think is gonna be fused faster? Something that's small or something that's big? Good, something that's small. So which do you think would fuse through this membrane faster? Something 235 or 238? 235. So the 235 um, comes through here and then it basically just separates the mixture. Now it's not perfect, right? Some of the 238 is gonna be able to effuse into that top container too, and some of the U235 isn't going to actually manage to effuse, but it gets them closer. It gets them so that this is enriched in U235. This, you can think of it either enriched in 238 or depleted of 235, whichever you care to call it. Now, that's not really probably quite 90% yet, so then they do it again. They fill this into another container just like this, and they separate it more. And they fill this into another container just like that and they separate it more to get out that extra 235 that's stuck in here. And so if we call, it, we'll call this a stage, this facility, 4,000 stages. So that's what it takes to urich uranium. 
So this one's in Tennessee. This is an enrichment facility in Tennessee. So that's how they go about enriching isotopes. And like I said, there are other ways. I spent most of my graduate um, career working with um, C carbon, special carbon and nitrogen isotopes. Um, so there's lots of different times that we need certain isotopes, and this is one of the ways that they can go about doing it. Okay, so that's the fun stuff. Now let's go back to doing some math, which is also fun. So this equation again, right? So let's do a little bit of derivation, because derivation is, is good for you. So I want to know, how do you relate two different gases? So, you know, for example, UF with this being 238 and this being 235. How can I relate those two? How can I relate the effusion of one to the effusion of the other? So, we basically want to take and we want to say, well, how are the masses related to the rates or the speeds of effusion? So, let's do a little bit of rearranging. First of all, if we had a situation like this, is the temperature going to be different? Is the temperature of the 238 going to be different than the temperature of the 235? No, right? Is, the diff is there a difference in temperature between the nitrogen in our air and the oxygen in the air in the room? No, it's all at room temperature, right? Okay, so the temperature is going to be the same. So one of the great tricks of deriving equations is to solve for the things that are the same. We did this with PV equals NRT too, right? What did we solve for? We solved for R and we set them equal to each other. Right? So great trick of derivation. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to solve for temperature. We're going to say, well, the temperature is the same, so it doesn't really matter. So we'll solve for T. Now, for, if we have two different samples, but they're at the same temperature, those are going to be equal to each other. So remember when we did this with PV equals NRT and we solved for R and then we set them equal to each other? We're going to do the same thing here. We solved for T. Now let's set them equal to each other. Okay. What's going to be the same here? Is the number three going to change from one side of the equation to the other? No, it's a number, right? Is R going to change from one side of the equation to the other? No. So what can we do with those? Get rid of them. Now, I did some rearranging here too. So you cross out the three R's, and then I solved for the speeds over top of the masses so that we can relate the speeds and the masses together. Now, one more set of rearranging, and we're going to rename one thing as well. So the rates, the, the RMS, this URMS in effusion, turns out they're, they're proportional to each other. So the rate of effusion is proportional to this, which means that we can just change it and say R1 and R2, because the rate's going to be proportional to the speed. And then I also square rooted both sides. Because in general, we would be solving for the rates, not the molar masses. Theoretically, we would know what masses we have. Not always. And I'll give you some examples where we don't. But usually, you see the, the thing written this way. So we can say that the speed is proportional to the rate. And so we change the rate, or we change the speed to rate, and we solved. OK? So this is a very useful equation to have now, too. Because we can take the rates, and we can relate them to the masses. OK, now we have a whole bunch of examples. So we'll finish up real gases next time, I guess, I, and then we'll start reviewing next time as well. Let's try to get through as much of this as we can, though. OK, a gas effuses 1.55 times faster than propane at the same temperature and pressure. Is the gas going to be heavier or lighter? It effuses faster. It's going to be lighter. Good. What's the molar mass? So if you want to know the molar mass of this, you set up the ratio like we did over there. And we say, well, the rate of one over the rate of the other is equal to the mass like that. Now, careful with this. Look back in your slides a minute and notice that whatever the, wherever the, the, the rate was here, that goes on the bottom, right? Because as the mass increases, the rate goes down. So make sure you recognize that they're crisscrossed. 
Now, we don't have the rate of A and the rate of B, but we do know that we, that we have this 1.55, which is that ratio solved out for us already. And so we can just put the 1.55 there. Now comes the part that we have to be careful of. It's not exactly hard, but it is, it is tricky. We have to figure out which number goes where and which one we're solving for. So 1.55, is that bigger than one or smaller than one? Bigger than one. So that means that in this ratio, the bigger one was on top or the smaller one was on top? Or let's, let's rephrase that. The faster one was on top or the slower one was on top? The faster one, right? Because the rate's faster. So if the faster one was on top here, where's the faster one going to go over here? Bottom. And that's the one we're solving for. So you have to be careful of that. Let me put the 44.0 there. Do I have to convert this one to kilograms? Mm, you're not sure. This one works the same way that when we did the P1, V1 over our N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. We didn't have to worry about units. Same reason here. It's a ratio. So whatever this is equal to, this one's going to come out as. And it doesn't really matter what unit it is. And so now we just have to square this and do the, the algebra for it, which I'll trust you to be able to do the algebra part of it. And you get 19.6 grams per mole. Okay? So the thing to be careful of here, the thing that's tricky here, is making sure you know which mass you're solving for. Now the plus is, is that we knew that it needed to be lighter, right? So is this lighter? Yeah, what if you had done it wrong? It would have come out to be heavier, right? And you could have said, oh wait, I did something wrong and must have flipped the M's and gone back and fixed it. Okay, so that wraps up for today.